Hello and welcome to Live at Epifan. This is episode 49. It's of course Thursday at 3 o'clock Eastern. So Dan and I are here to talk about something interesting to do with live streaming. Uh, so what is that interesting today, Dan? Well, today we're actually going to talk about uh, network bonding, which uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, is really about trying to increase the redundancy and the speed of your network. And of course, you know, the more bandwidth you have for live streaming, the higher quality bit rate you can send in your encoding, which results in a, a higher quality live stream. So there's lots to learn about this. We do have uh, an expert who will be joining us in a moment. But first, George, I know you wanted to talk about some news today. Yeah, a couple of news items. First one, obviously, I, I guess we've mentioned it uh, last week as well. Uh, the firmware update for Webcaster X2, uh, which added support for Twitch, uh, is out there. So if you own a Webcaster and using Twitch or experimenting on Twitch or any of those uh, sorts of things, are interesting to you, uh, update the firmware and uh, you should be able to check that out and take advantage of it. Um, it seems interesting and, and of course as we've covered in previous shows, Twitch is a growing platform um, that has all kinds of, of interesting things and a huge audience so uh, go ahead and experiment. You might find it's, it's a great platform uh, for your particular needs. I've really noticed that the in real life category on Twitch has been growing quite a bit. So. Yeah. It's nice to see that they're expanding beyond just gaming in some ways. Uh, so some of the in real life content is really interesting how they're doing it, whether it's exercise videos or yeah. cooking shows. Um, there's a lot of fun things that you can actually find there. Exactly. Um, there's something else we did want to mention as well, and that is that there's a Webcaster X2 giveaway happening. Um, so in, in celebration of our 50th episode, we've decided to give away a, a Webcaster X2 to one of our lucky audience members. So um, if you'd like to enter the contest, it's really simple. Um, just go check out um, our YouTube uh, stream of this, video, of this video, episode 49, and in the YouTube description, you're going to see a link to enter the contest using Gleam. Yeah. Um, and actually, why don't we just, uh, yeah, for those of you on Facebook right now, we'll, we'll get someone to uh, copy-paste the link into chat for you as well so that yeah. you can enter the contest. I am watching chat, but uh, I, uh, I don't have those links quite on hand. But yeah, we'll have those links. We'll make sure um, someone puts them in there before the end of the yeah, show. Or, we did uh, share them on Facebook the other day as well, so you might have already seen that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, a chance to win a, a free webcaster. So definitely uh, check that out. And Gleam.io is so easy to enter. There's always lots of different ways to earn extra free entries. And it's always the simple stuff. Follow, like, yeah. subscribe, all those things. That Which you should be doing anyway. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. So um, lastly, just as you know, this is a live show. So if you do have any questions throughout the episode, don't be shy. Put your questions in chat. Uh, we're happy to answer them. And uh, we'll be monitoring chat live. Exactly. Um, so let's jump into our main topic. Again, we wanted to talk about network bonding today, and we have a special guest joining us. Mm -hmm. So why don't we introduce our guest now? He is the CEO and founder of Mushroom Networks, Jay Aiken. Jay, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi, Dan. Hi, George. Hey, it's great to have you here. So um, uh, why don't we just start at the beginning? You're, you're the founder of this company, so why don't you tell us about... Um, um, who Mushroom Networks is and what sort of inspired the birth of this company? Sure. Uh, Mushroom Networks, uh, it, we really uh, are founded on a vision of uh, networks being on autopilot. So anyone who dealt with regular networks, wireless or wired, knows they, they will have their uh, problems, ups and downs, uh, reliability issues, uh, bandwidth issues, speed issues. So we, uh, being in a, uh, at the time, uh, this actually was a technology that has been worked on within University of California, San Diego. And I was a, a, a partner at a venture fund looking for opportunities. So things came together and we decided to uh, spin out Mushroom Networks, uh, which still to this day uh, has uh, the vision of setting networks on autopilot. Uh, hopefully uh, in our uh, decade long history, we made some, uh, we put some bricks, so to speak, in that path. And uh, the way we uh, approach that problem is to uh, have two or more resources at hand. So uh, on our enterprise product line where we combine wired internet lines to make the office networks faster, uh, we combine any type of wired lines. On our portable and mobile 
uh, product line. We do the same for 3G, 4G, LTE, and hopefully soon uh, the upcoming 5G networks. And the idea is intelligently managing those links to enhance the end user experience. Perfect. That, Excellent. Kind of sounds like exactly what a lot of people into mobile live streaming would need and, and something that we've talked about on this show many, many times when people have asked about mobile live streaming is you, you got to make sure you have the bandwidth available or, or your live stream's not going anywhere. And one of the biggest downsides with, you know, maybe using your phone for tethering is that, you know, if you get a dip in signal, your bandwidth is dipping too. And so it can be very inconsistent, uh, unlike a hard line. Um, so, yeah, it sounds like, you know, that's kind of exactly the best way to solve that problem. <laughs> yeah, I think... I think you nailed it there in terms of the reliability aspect, because when we uh, talk to folks, they usually uh, initially uh, 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 kind of look at the speed aspect of things. Oh, I want a faster pipe, right, by combining multiple. But I, even though obviously that's a, a fundamental and super important, uh, but one other uh, hidden aspect of being able to utilize multiple links is the reliability. Because by definition, wireless, you can have the best networks, best technology, by definition, because of the all the fading, fast fading, slow fading involved, there will be fluctuations. It's by definition unpredictable. And if you can address that and make it much more predictable, uh, uh, that's a hidden value uh, that using multiple lines intelligently gives you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Excellent. So. So you touched on it a bit before, but I'm just wondering, you know, what kind of networks are people bonding? You know, uh, here in our office, we obviously have Ethernet and we've got Wi-Fi throughout our office. Um, but certain areas, the Wi-Fi might work a little better than others. Um, but, you know, sometimes we like to take our show on the road and we like to get out of the office. So, you know, maybe you could give a summary of like some of the type of bonds that are most common and what people are looking for. Sure. I think I, I would say the most common is absolutely uh, the wireless networks, uh, 3G, 4G, LTE networks. However, it's it's not uncommon that our clients sometimes bring in a wired line they happen to have in, in a venue. Uh, or sometimes, as you said, there's a Wi-Fi signal. Uh, they can add that into the mix, too. The nice thing is, or one thing uh, that uh, uh, when, you, when you're doing this, you need to be aware of the tunnel that you're using needs to auto adjust to those performance differences. Uh, and and that's kind of needs to be baked in into, into the system. Uh, so you can literally bond any type of connection, including satellite, which has a completely different uh, latency throughput profile compared to the other links. Uh, but you can uh, combine them, bring them together. And there are certain uh, sort of technologies uh, that are in play there. Uh, not to get into too much detail, but for example, if you do network coding, before you transmit the traffic, which basically distributes the data over the multiple links and therefore gives the ability to reconstruct any error or lost packets. That gives you a, a lot of advantage in terms of mixing and matching any type of connection you want. So in a sense, uh, you're saying that like the, the, the network data can be aggregated offsite in the cloud or on a in another location and, and recombined it and, and, and any packets that might have been lost from one connection can be recuperated from the other one. Exactly. So uh, the way we, we basically have the architecture, the field units, and I have a few which maybe I'll show later, uh, it's, it's in, in a location where you have your uh, limited wired area network resources. And then in the cloud, uh, and this can be a, either a, your private cloud or in, in most cases our clients prefer to use the mushroom uh, infrastructure for that cloud, uh, where those partial uh, streams come to the cloud instance using that technology, combining and intelligently reconstructing any lost packets, pretty much cleaning up the video to shield any type of uh, network problems. And once the, and this is all happening in real time, of course, and that cleaned up stream is then a relay to its destination, and it might be uh, any CD and any RTMP server uh, you want. Excellent. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. So it's not just purely, so Mushroom as a company doesn't only provide just a simple, you know, router that allows me to plug in multiple networks. You do have a, a back-end sort of technology offering as well. 
Um, which is great because, yeah, there's some people who are going to need that ultra liability of, of piecing it back together. But from a from a basic standpoint, what some what would you say in your experience is one of the easiest ways to get a, a highly reliable connection? How many 4G networks, for example, uh, it would be considered the minimum for a reliable uh, connection? Sure, I, I think. Uh, but when I when I uh, advise uh, clients or when we, when we discuss uh, these topics, I usually uh, highlight some of the hidden risks that, uh, as as broadcasters, we, we don't necessarily immediately. But uh, even even in, in terms of a, a a single wired line, you may bump into issues because there might be some upstream uh, cross traffic, right? You wouldn't be expecting. Let's say it's a uh, a line in a hotel, uh, and uh, if if it's getting clogged by a lot of other people doing, let's say, uh, YouTube watching, uh, you don't have that wired clean experience. So that's, I think, one important aspect where you really don't want to put your all your eggs into a single basket, whatever that basket might be, wired or fiber or the best line. So I think that's my first recommendation to, to broadcasters usually. If you can try to have more more resources to add uh, into the mix, and on, on, in terms of the uh, 4G, 3G, 4G LTE model, uh, we our product line goes from two, four, eight, so we support up to eight cellular modems. I I, I would say, and this depends of course depending on the country, uh, how well the coverage and the networks are, uh, but I think four usually is a, a nice number where you can. Usually you have four different carriers, so you can mix and match uh, the uh, primary carriers in your location. Uh, if you want to double up on those, uh, certainly you can do two, two, two. I do have clients using all eight from a single carrier or all four from a single carrier. And I do have clients using two lines. That's also better than one line. Uh, right. But I like uh, a four as a, as a go-to number. I think that's a, that's a good advice. Yeah, definitely sounds like it. I mean, obviously, like you say, it depends on what carriers are available in that specific geography. Um, and But I guess generally one of the, the advantages is using those different carriers, they're all in some cases going to use different frequencies. So hopefully there's less interference on one versus another, uh, especially if you're dealing with maybe large conference centers like we've done on the sh on the show floor things like that where Absolutely. there's so much interference from everything else that, that's happening that trying to cut through yep. it uh the more chances you have the better off you're going to be absolutely i mean the key term is diversity there both in terms of frequency as well as the south tower back holes and then uh, using uh, and that that's basically part of uh, the bonding technologies we you you want to utilize uh, transports that that can get the best out of the available resources in any given location. For example, the uh, conference example is a great one. So if you can uh, get more juice out of out of that available bandwidth because you're using certain uh, techniques, that's of course always an advantage too. So it sounds like the perfect solution. Um, so for me, the question becomes, why doesn't everybody do this? Why doesn't everybody's home router have this built in? Because it sounds like it's, you know, the best possible solution for reliability. Uh, why is this not more common? Is it a matter of of cost? I guess if I had to have four data plans for four different cell carriers, that, that could get expensive, especially here in Canada. Maybe in the U.S. it's not so bad, but here in Canada, that's a, that's a few hundred dollar proposition uh, monthly. So is that really kind of one of the barriers? I, I think there's definitely that cost aspect of it, uh, especially on the consumer side of the equation, even though uh, we started seeing uh, some prosumer uh, home office type applications where our products are used. And this is now not necessarily video, but making their home office uh, basically reliable. Uh, for enterprises, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, this is the way to uh, uh, enhance the reliability and availability compared to a, a, a single line, uh, with, uh, which might be even more expensive in some cases. So you can really save in terms of cost. On the consumer side, though, uh, there's definitely that aspect. Although I, I can certainly envision uh, uh, where uh, you have either shared plans or within the family you have multiple plans that, that kind of chip in into those resources and, and becomes 
uh, becomes relevant. But it, it really also is a function of uh, what you want to achieve in terms of applications. Is, is that mission critical for you? I think for live video streaming, that aspect is definitely front and center. Absolutely. Uh, right? You, you want to be absolutely high quality and highly reliable. Uh, if your home network goes down and you can't surf for 10 seconds, maybe that's acceptable. Although our vision is to eliminate all that. Right. <laughs> So, Eventually. so Jay, I see you've got some uh, some some gear on the desk next to you. Maybe you could uh, show us uh, some of the products that Mushroom Networks has to offer, and uh, kind of give us an idea of like what levels of uh, equipment exist in this realm. Sure, sounds good. So I'll I'll start with the uh, uh, little kit, uh, which is our uh, small uh, appliance. Which I don't know if you can see from the camera, but has two. SIM slots at the front and four antennas because it uses MIMO diversity. So you'll be able to take advantage of the latest uh, uh, cellular technology. And on the back end, it will have its Ethernet port. Okay, cool. And that Ethernet okay. port can take the combined uh, mobile uh, internet into a single fast internet line. And this would, for example, connect to a Epifan uh, uh, encoder uh, and, or a switcher and providing access to that bonded self-correcting connectivity. Right. And we have, uh, let me quickly show you uh, the middle kit, uh, which is the uh, four port version with eight antennas. Uh, ID is the same. Uh, so you can take this uh, with an ethernet or Wi-Fi. And then finally, uh, we have the uh, streamer pro product line which is slightly different as it has a built-in encoder so the input is sdi uh, and and it, the the thing that's different is in this device you have uh, usb dongles as opposed to the other uh, built-in modems so uh, especially if you're doing any international traveling and broadcasting uh, you can plug it in any type of modem so that gives extra flexibility some some uh, users prefer that I guess that makes sense. In some cases, it might be nice to just pop in a SIM card, but you know, for us, if we're in the U.S., we might run into some problems there. Whereas if we have like a dongle with the modem in it, yeah, um, that's all. It's just a connection, right? Yeah. yeah. And in some places, you can buy those on a on a pay-as-you-go, you know, one-time thing. So they're pretty easy to, to pick up and, and deal with uh, without having to worry about the you know different type of SIM cards and all those sorts of things that right. that are popular these days. So yeah, so that's great. Um, so, obviously today a lot of people are going to be using just 4G LTE as that's sort of the current standard. Uh, and I think for the most part, as long as you have a, a strong signal, that provides sufficient bandwidth provided it's a good signal. And as we've talked, you know, sometimes you want to have multiple of those to stabilize the signal. But what do we see coming next? What's, what's after 4G? I mean, I think especially with single connection 4G, we're kind of starting to push the limits of what it can handle. So what do you see coming next that obviously Mushroom is working on and might interest our customers who need all the bandwidth they can get? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, on the cellular side, I think uh, we, we see that 10 year cycle of new technologies coming in and getting deployed uh, all the way going to IS95, uh, the, the 2G, 3G, 4G, and the next one is obviously 5G, uh, uh, which is actually uh, gonna get some initial uh, I guess we can call them uh, uh, alpha deployments, rollouts uh, later this year. Uh, I heard some yeah, because the carriers are racing to, to, to be first to, to roll roll that out, uh, either on the millimeter uh, bands or uh, even in the uh, sub gigahertz band. So there's different technologies basically that uh, people call 5G, but uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be the next gen and uh, theoretically getting above. Uh, one gig uh, bit rates, uh, okay. which is fantastic, I think. Uh, gig, uh, even though in practice, obviously, it's going to be uh, a, a little lower, uh, which will provide even more resources for for live streaming. So, uh, and and uh, of course, on on the, I always like to say the application finds a way to fill in the available pipe, uh, and and those applications sometimes we you, you know sometimes you don't know. Uh, we don't know if it's going to be the uh, 3D streaming or the higher resolution, uh, but hopefully the networks will keep up 
with all those new trends, the new codecs, the new new applications coming in. So uh, we're excited, and and it will take, of course, some time. Uh, I think uh, uh, the ten year uh, product maturation uh, cycle uh, will happen with 5G as well. Uh, but it's 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 a great, I think. Uh, enhancement in, in cellular networks. Well, we're certainly excited to see where it goes. And, and I mean, you touched on it perfectly. Is the bigger the pipe, we'll find a way to fill it. And whether it's streaming in 4K or whether it's doing 360 video or maybe high dynamic range content, there's always there's always room to, to, yeah. to grow the quality and, and to, to take advantage of the bandwidth that is available. So And the market for streaming is only growing, as, as we've touched on many times on this show. You know the the usage patterns are only going higher and higher. So, um, you know the the need for high bandwidth and stable bandwidth is only getting more and more important. So, um, but I wanted to uh, take a couple of questions here and look. Um, one of our Facebook uh, viewers was asking about: uh, Does the bonding happen on the end user side uh, or on the broadcasting side, uh, and is it more of a software or hardware based solution? Uh, I guess my understanding of Mushroom Network's products for the most part is it's a, a hardware solution on the end user side initially, and then there is that sort of server side possibility as well. Is, is that right? That is, that is correct. The, uh, on, on the CPE side, on the uh, end user side, we do offer a software for virtualized environments. So if you have a Hyper-V VMware and want to throw it onto your uh, laptop, uh, we do have that option as well. Uh, uh, I, I, I would say since our hardware is optimized specifically for the, the use case, uh, it usually is the better option, uh, but uh, in some cases you don't control some of the requirements, uh, so we, we provide that option as well. But in terms of uh, the two-sided aspect, the component I was explaining earlier, the uh, cloud component which does the correction, that's basically that added benefit where you get uh, that auto correction and, and therefore being able to, really it boils down to being able to generate the exact same feed coming out of your encoder in the, the cloud. So uh, it's as if your encoder is in the cloud and then you're sending it wherever it needs to go. Right. Um, one of the other questions in here, um, not so much for you, Jay, but in general was, you know, how much would a data plan cost? Obviously, that's going to depend on your service provider, how much data, at least here in Canada, one of the things we struggle with is there's essentially no such thing as unlimited data plans here in Canada. Um, so it can be very expensive to have a lot of, of data. Um, so obviously, you know, you, you have to look at what your local uh, service mm -hmm. providers can offer. But I mean, as competition increases and as more people adopt these technologies, um, that will come. you know, absolutely, time, time will reduce the cost for sure uh, so you know shop around look there's always deals to find so absolutely yeah and if we're talking about purely data that's different from you know your cell plan where it's data yep. and voice and everything else right um, if we're talking about purely data it's it's mm -hmm. gonna be uh, not mm -hmm. not too bad um, another question here this one's specifically just about webcast or someone asking if uh, webcast would ever stream to Facebook and YouTube at the same time uh, we've probably addressed that more than once on the show, but uh, no, it, it's a it's a low powered device that just wouldn't have the the power to run both of those streams simultaneously. Um, so you would either have to use two webcasters or look at a more powerful encoder, something like uh, Pearl Two or the upcoming Pearl Mini, which you'll have, obviously we've covered that a little bit. There'll be a ton more information coming on that product. Um, uh, and someone was also asking about how is something like Mushroom different. Um, from load balancing so software like Collective or Amplify? Perfect, it's, it's actually a great question. It comes uh, back to uh, that server side component that we were discussing. In uh, load balancing, the idea is you take a session and, and only one of the for that session. So that works okay if you have more than one session. Let's say you're in an office environment and you have hundreds of sessions and you, you can distribute them over the available links, you, you do get uh, the benefit of aggregation. Even though it's not the fine granularity, you still get that benefit. For live streaming specifically, uh, you do have only one session. That is your RTMP or if it's UDP based, whatever that protocol is, you have one session. And if you load balance, uh, all of the other links will be sitting idle 
and you'll be only be using one of the lines. However, if you do uh, uh, what we call true bonding, uh, which is really load balancing at a packet granularity. So what you're doing is taking one session, splitting it up into smaller chunks that go over different paths, and as they come all to that uh, cloud relay, uh, they are stitched back together. And then you can, of course, pepper on top all that protective uh, and reconstructive technologies that I mentioned earlier, so that you have, have that aspect. So they are related technologies. I would say uh, broadband bonding is the next gen uh, version of load balancing. Perfect, okay, great. Well, that was all the questions that we had from our audience. Of course, uh, to all of you watching, if, if you have any more questions or any insights or thoughts, uh, feel free to put those in chat and we'll, uh, we'll probably get back to you at, at a later time on those. Um, so I think that pretty much covers it today. Um, yeah, so I really want to thank you, Jay, for joining us. It's been great to have you here and to get some of your uh, expert insight on this topic. Pleasure is mine. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, George. Great. So we'll Thanks, st we'll stay in touch with you, Jay. And if anyone wants to um, um, follow up with Jay, you can obviously find him at Mushroom Networks, mushroomnetworks.com. Uh, we'll provide a link in the video description as usual. Uh, but for now, I think we'll probably call it a day. Yeah. And, of course, next week, as we mentioned off the top, this is episode 49, which means next week is episode 50. We will be giving away that webcaster uh, during next week's show. So uh, definitely uh, stay tuned for that, and hopefully you will be the lucky winner. We also have some very interesting ideas for what to do for our big 5.0 episode. Uh, so there's some cool stuff coming there uh, that uh, we don't want to give away yet. Now let's I'm, keep it I'm a hoping, secret for now. Yeah, I think should be good, though. Uh, so hopefully join us next week. We're here every Thursday at 3 o'clock Eastern talking about something to do with streaming uh, with our either just Dan and I or other George or a wonderful guest like Jay. Hopefully it's useful to all of you, and uh, we'll see you next week. Okay. So long, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.